Happy Sabbath. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks. We thank you for the combinatorial offering that's happened so far. As your word proceeds, we thank you for those who are listening online. We thank you for audio video. We thank you for the musicians. Father, we thank you for the praise team and all those that made this service possible today. In the name of Jesus, we just ask that we keep our minds locked into the throne room even now so that we may behold and see your face. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, it's good to see you guys. It's good to be back. Um, when uh, Pastor Labrador asked me about this week, I was like, absolutely, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Can't have the ladies bending down here make me look bad my mom's in the audience I'm not gonna hear the end of that <laughs> listen um, so today's discussion is complicated but it's not complicated and one of the 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 title of the sermon is following with the theme rooted and grounded a sweet smelling aroma the age of the father and the moral cleansing of human tabernacles. Does that make sense? No. Praise God. I love it. That means we're going to grow today. Amen. Amen. I want to make it plain for you today. We're looking at three things. First, being rooted and grounded. The second thing that we're looking at is what? Moral cleansing. The third thing is the age of the father. Now, I'm coming from a book you know very well and clear, Ephesians chapter 1. Let's turn there for a second in Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm going to build a base there, and we're going to be also going next to um, Leviticus, uh, dealing with some of the Day of the Atonement information. Um, before we read verses 17 through 21... There is a prologue in Paul's discussion that's in pretty much every chapter, but it's very fascinating because in verse 2 of chapter 1, he says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says this in pretty much every one of his greetings in the books that he writes. Have you ever, has this ever puzzled you? For me, it's puzzled me because why does he greet with grace and peace? Well, he greets with grace and peace because potentially there had to have been a war, correct? Now, in the back of the book, uh, in Ephesians and in Colossians, it talks about children of wrath and children of disobedience. Now, when sin came into the world, something changed. Our dynamics changed in relationship to God. Satan knocked us out of holiness and turned us into terrorists. He made us become wrath or children of disobedience towards God. We were no longer peaceful, but now we were considered a threat to heaven. See, the coming of Christ wasn't just to forgive your sins. The coming of Christ was to bring peace back into the cosmos because our decision to choose rebellion made us terrorists to God. And we deserved death. But because of Christ, we are able to be back at peace with God. See, Jesus' death on the cross wasn't just so that you could be saved. It was also for him to get rid of the terrorism plaguing the cosmos. That terrorism was sin. You see, now, the, now when we look at the text, the Bible says here, after Paul talks about these introductions and what Christ is going to do, and they're beautiful, we don't have time for it today, but he says something very specific today. He says in 16, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. First of all, saints of God, one of the greatest theologians of the biblical history in the New Testament, Paul, is talking about prayer. No one is too good to get on their knees and cry out to God. And what Paul is saying here is, I'm praying for you Ephesians. The context 
And what Christ did in the Old Testament through the priest was prayer service. When we look at the sanctuary, we saw that in the morning and in the evening, the priest offered sacrifices and prayed for all of Israel on behalf of God as a type of what Christ was doing in heaven for us. You see, the context of the Ephesian chapter is the sanctuary. And it's bringing the reader back to that. So as a priest of God, you must realize that prayer is essential for being rooted and grounded in Jesus. Amen? And Paul is bringing us back to the sanctuary that was given to them in the desert. That's saying that just as the priest prayed, I am praying for you. Being rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ, if you are not praying, there are no roots. If you're not praying, you will not be grounded because prayer is how the tabernacle, your tabernacle, streams to God. And he streams to you. We're going to get into that a little bit more. So now he says, now kept asking that the Lord, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Let's talk about that for a second. One of the things that Jesus desired from the work that he did was so that you could know the Father better. Amen? But didn't he say something? No one can get to the Father except through the Son. That means that part of being rooted and grounded and receiving the word from the Father is accepting Jesus Christ in your life. Amen? So we have prayer. We have the acceptance of Christ in your life so that we can get access to who? The Father. When we became terrorists to heaven, we lost connection to the Father. And the Father is so holy that he does not tolerate sin on any level. So before the foundations of the world, one of the praise and worship songs... (laughs) before the foundations of the world when God foreknew what was coming to pass he created the plan of salvation that would redeem not just us but the cosmos do you recognize that because of sin the entire cosmos was in disarray sin's effect affected them differently but it affected us where we fell but it put doubt into the cosmos as to who the rightful ruler would be. The first form of atonement in Leviticus chapter 1 was the burnt offering, chapters 1 through 3. When you came to Jesus, before you could receive forgiveness, you had to pray. Then you had to bring a sacrificial lamb. That lamb was Jesus. Now, all of this was to prepare for the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement was the one day that the sacrificial lamb did nothing for you. The only person that could cleanse you on that day was God himself. And that cleansing was a moral cleansing. Let's continue. Let's continue in this particular verse. I'm dropping that there because we're coming back for this. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glory, inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. Some, some authors have that as right side. In Leviticus 16.30, on the Day of Atonement, there was a moral purification which is beyond atonement. When your sins are forgiven on the Day of Atonement in Israel, there was something that God did that, that nothing that they could do could accomplish. So they all got prepared for the Day of Atonement in faith and they waited there with their hearts trembling because they were hoping that their sins were forgiven and now they wanted God to cleanse them morally. 
This was a type of what the father was going to do after Jesus was dead, raised, and gone to heaven. You see, the members of the Godhead work in salvation to save all of us in a combinatorial way. In the Old Testament, they offered multiple things, grain, wine, for some of you, if you do not like this word, maybe some unfermented drink, but there were no refrigerators, so I'm just going to say, <laughs> say wine, <laughs> wine as well as meat. The offerings were combinatorial. So when we approach heaven, when we approach God, what Jesus does is cover you with his blood. Now you are purified. Now you are blameless. But doesn't the Holy Spirit do something? He wraps you as a sweet incense and lifts up your prayers before God and even says things that you don't even understand, the Bible says, to the point where the Bible says that he even understands your groanings, the words that you cannot say. And then when the Father looks at you, he doesn't see wrath. He doesn't see a terrorist. What he sees is the sun in you. He sees the blood of God wrapping you and pronouncing you blameless before God. And now he's able to do that thing that Jesus died for, which is to prepare you to be reacclimated to holy society. Come on now. Come on now. What the, the rooted and grounded series is doing, like in Proverbs chapter 2, we see is that storing up the word of God inside of you enables God to help you to meditate on the love and the blessings of God so that the Father can take you beyond the commandments and cleanse you morally for eternal holy living. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. God came not just to save you, but to prepare you to be royal priests for all eternity. And he's not starting at the second coming. He's starting today. That's why your body will be changed in a moment, in a twinkling, right when the Lord comes. But your character, it ain't changing because your character has already been changed, transformed, renewed when you accepted Jesus right here. That's why the text says, sanctify him in your heart. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. And now if you, if you think that the word has nothing to do with you, there's another text that says, wash your wife in the word of God. Come on now. When you minister to your wife with the word of God, you are purifying her tabernacle, preparing her to engage with holy use. Come on, look at him smiling. <laughs> There's going to be some holy use going on this weekend out of town. Praise God. But it's holy. Amen. The word of God is holy. Thus, that activity is holy. And because he washes her with the word of God, he's not just preparing her for his holy tabernacle, but so that the Holy Spirit can dwell fully in her. When you serve before others, you can't look at them just as random beings. You have to look at them as the place where God resides. The words that we say to people affect our ontological nature, how we interact with them, our state of being. If we think that someone is beneath us, then we are going to treat them like trash. And the reason you treat them like trash is because you think you're trash. Come on now. Because if you loved God and you knew who you were and you knew who you were in respect to God, every being that you looked at, would you realize that it's the potential for the divine to fully dwell in them and that you have the ability to change their relationship with God. The text says that in 2 Corinthians 2, verses two, uh, 12 through 15, that there is an aroma of knowledge. We're talking about sacrifice. 
and a sweet smelling aroma, taking it back to the sanctuary service. When you have been wrapped with Jesus and wrapped with the Holy Ghost, now you have a sweet smelling aroma. Those sacrificial systems have been done away with because Christ fulfilled them all. Now Paul is taking it and making it practical because in John 2, the Bible says Jesus spoke of the temple of the body, which was himself. And Romans tell us that you are the temple where the Holy Ghost resides. So when you keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus, the aroma that you let off is a holy aroma. That holy aroma attracts God to reside in your temple and angels to rejoice. But when you talk about people, when you lie about others, when you cause contempt and distortion within your community, the aroma, the stench that you let off is an aroma pleasing for Satan to dwell. Come on now. The text says there are two aromas, one to life and one to death. The aroma of the Rooted and Grounded series is so that you have an aroma to life and have it more abundantly. That more abundantly is not personal wealth. That more abundantly is not more money. That more abundantly is the fullness of the Godhead dwelling bodily in you first. That's why the Bible says that beloved above all things, I wish that you would prosper as your soul prospers. When your soul prospers first, all these things will be added unto you. See, the devil's kingdom, they don't have to do right to do well. But in God's kingdom, for him to have claims on your assets, you must walk blamelessly before him. And see, Satan does just enough. To get you to be a little blame, unblameless. That's not a real word. Don't beat me up. Okay? <laughs> just taking a little liberty there. Satan does just enough. When we look at the Balaam and Balak story, he says, there's nothing you can do if they keep the commandments of God. In fact, when he tried to curse them, he couldn't say it. Which tells you that when you walk blameless before God, even your enemies cannot curse you. You see, that parable teaches us something. He tried. He says, no, no, no. As long as the shout of the king is in the war camp, you cannot even speak against them. But see, when you do something that takes you out of the will of God, now Satan can start to cause a ruckus in your family, in your life on your job because he's like that aroma ain't sweet that aroma looks like me and i know i have the liberty to step in now god is fighting for a sweet aroma god is fighting to cleanse you beyond the basics of scripture god is trying to elevate his students and his children to teach the unfallen worlds. Why is the moral cleansing important? When we take a look in Ephesians 3.10, I want you to take a look at this for one second. Ephesians 3.10. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Sin never happened before. In all the cosmos, it had never happened before. This is the first time it's ever existed. And when God, because he foreknew, he saw, I'm going to use your name, Jasmine. Don't beat me up. He foresaw Jasmine before he even created the word wisdom. And then he saved wisdom for this moment in time and said, I'm going to bring you here now because you're the greatest fight against sin. I'm going to save you, Carl, because you're the greatest fight against sin. And during this auspicious time, the antitypical day of atonement, you're going to, because the whole cosmos is experiencing the same thing, you're going to be revealing the depths of my love because I'm going to choose the church to reveal the innermost thoughts of my being to unfallen people. When we take 
the commandments of God lightly, we don't have an opportunity to teach those who are looking on, trying to learn, because God is working through sinful human beings who've chosen to set themselves apart to be holy in order to reveal the depths of his love. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's how important you are. You're not an afterthought. What God is saying is that these people love me so much that in a sinful state, they will choose righteousness over death. And I'm going to show those who had doubt, even though they hadn't picked from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that how deep my love goes, not just for now, but for all eternity. What we do now is going to be the global precedent for the worlds to come. Millions of years from now, your actions and your revelations will be marked in the third epistle of the Bible. Your testimonies will reflect what God did and how you changed the lives of others. So when new worlds are created, you priests will be the ones to administer the love of God and to teach those new beings what it means, the knowledge of good and evil. Because you are the only ones that have firsthand experience of what evil really feels like and what it does. So God is showing the cosmos and an extreme case that I can cleanse the dirtiest of created beings. And I can cleanse them in sinful bodies because I'm that powerful, I'm that dope, and I'm that type of God. Come on now. He's showing you the extent, the richness of his love, that his love goes beyond just keeping the word of God. So when worlds come into future, he says, that's how far I'll go to save humanity. That even when they messed up, I sent angels to stand by them every day. When they accepted Jesus Christ, then I came and I cleansed them morally. Even though their bodies were decaying, their minds were being built up. There's an inverse relationship. Though death is in the body, but the mind is in Christ. And you're growing in love towards God every single day. The Father wants to prepare you for your eternal work. But the only way he can prepare you is if you accept Jesus Christ in your heart. As it's written in the Torah, in the Psalms, and in the Gospels. Today, Jesus is saying... Don't harden your hearts. The Father wants to give you the same thing that he gave me. And what Jesus is saying, what Paul is saying here, and what Jesus said when he was walking, he says, I didn't come of myself, but I came of the Father that sent me. So Paul is saying here, the same Father that empowered Christ, that gave him that power that he had, he now wants to give that to you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you recognize that when Jesus rose from the grave, the Greek says that he, along with the father, rose himself. They rose together. When they called him, he rose himself. That's why he said he is the resurrection. And death had no power over him. So that same power that he wants to give to, that he gave to Jesus, he has given to Carl. He has given to you. But the only way you can tap it is to store up the commandments of God in your heart. The precepts of God. When we look at Proverbs chapter 2, turn with me real quick. I don't want to, uh, I, I think I'm almost at my time. But if we look at Proverbs chapter 2, and the first eight chapters of Proverbs actually deal with how to understand moral cleansing. What to do with wisdom? It says here, my son, if you accept my words and store up my commands with you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as silver and search for it as his in treasure, then you will understand the what? Fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Let me rephrase that. Some people may want to interpret that fear as being afraid. No, then you will understand the holiness of God or the reverence of God, right? So now you'll understand the reverence of the Lord and you'll find the knowledge of God. How do we know more about who God is? The first thing is through his word. This is the first 
action that we can do is to actively read his word. Even if you don't feel like eating, you know you need to eat or else you might pass out. So doesn't the spiritual man need to be fed every single day, at least morning and evening, in order for you to not pass out by the wiles of the devil? Amen? So now we see here, for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He holds success in store for the upright. And you're upright if you look at Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But what does he do? His delight is in the law of God. In it he meditates day and night. And what happens? Then he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, bringing fruit in its season. That's who you are. Trees that bring forth righteous fruit. Not on a righteous fruit. So when the wind blows, you don't blow away. You're not like the chaff because you're rooted and grounded deep in the word of God. When the bills start piling up, you don't get flustered. Somehow you're still praising God while people are looking at you, but didn't they turn off your gas? Didn't they take your car? Didn't you lose your job? Yes, but God is still on the throne, so I'm grateful for the love of God that sustains me and carries me. Or when you have your business and you can't make payroll, but you had to mortgage something so that you could pay your employees on time and you couldn't eat, you say, praise God, because I was able to let my employees eat and be a good leader. Come on, somebody. Maybe that's not happening to you. But what about when you when you got fired from your job for something you didn't do for somebody lied about you and now all your credits messed up because you missed those on time payments that you've been doing for 10 years and now you're under 500 and you used to be 850 come on somebody and now you're saying god why is this happening to me god entrust his greatest trials to his strongest warriors. And when the warriors get to the point where nothing phases them, like Paul says, I'm in heavenly places, but he was in prison, Satan worries. This is why in Revelation 12, those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony, Satan is in panic mode because they reveal the holiness of God in a sinful world and they cause other people to follow them. That scares him. You see, when you read Revelation, eventually that there's only one woman. There aren't two. That one woman, Satan no longer has an issue with. By the time you get to chapter 18, the woman looks just like Babylon. But the commandment keepers and have the testimony of Jesus, there is no issue with God with them. But Satan is scared of them because they remain faithful to God, loyal to God, and they never took on the aroma or the stench which he offered, which was this world. You are beautiful, holy beings. And all I'm asking you today is... Pick up your word. Don't forsake your Bible. Don't forget prayer. Don't forget song and worship. This combinatorial offering is what's going to keep you standing before God's face, standing before him holy, and that Satan can have claims on you. That combinatorial offering is going to enable the Father to cleanse you above and beyond the basics of thou shall not steal, thou shall not commit adultery. That's the basics. The Father's trying to cleanse you to the point where you're contemplating things of heaven. And when you're talking amongst each other, those unfallen beings are saying, I didn't know that. What he just said to his wife, we never heard it like that before. Because the text says that God is revealing in you, through his church, the manifold wisdom of God that was preordained before the foundations of the world. You're that important. That baby that's coming is that important. So share the word with that baby. That share the word with your spouse. Share the word with your friends if they ask. And don't forsake it. You're that important. 
Let the Father cleanse you by filling yourself with the word of God each and every day, covered with the blood of the Lamb, wrapped in the Holy Spirit. And now you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost dwelling in you. The fullness of the Godhead bodily as it was in Christ, it's also in you. This is the mystery of the gospel, that the fullness of God can be in your sinful body and reveal the nature and love of God to unfallen beings, even though you are sinners. <clears throat> I want to thank you for listening. Thank you so much. <laughs> My mouth went dry. <laughs> um, I want to close by asking if anyone has never given their heart to Jesus or is looking for a deeper relationship with God through study of his word or a more focused study of his word Sometimes we study at home and it's chaotic. We don't even know what we are doing. We're just reading and it's, it's stressful. But if you're looking for a closer walk with God through the reading of his holy word, through prayer and understanding how to walk that blameless life, I ask that you, if you don't feel like coming down, raise your hand. And one of the elders, one of the members here will follow up with you if you haven't, to, to make sure that your living changes from this day going forward. That your reality changes, a reality that leads to eternal life versus a reality that leads to death. Is there anyone who is interested in further Bible studies? I got one down here. One in the back. So just raise your hand high so Brother Carl can see. If you haven't been a part of it, but you want further Bible studies, we have two so far. And again, if you haven't given your heart to Jesus, I also ask you to give him a shot. Giving your heart to Jesus is going to change your reality in the sense of now you're moving towards an aroma of life an aroma that allows the Father to cleanse and the Holy Spirit to wrap you. Your relationship with the rest of the world is going to change. I promise you that. Is there anyone that wants to give their heart to Jesus today? Amen. Bible study and heart. And what I'm saying is that you have never been baptized either and you want to be baptized into the household of God. The Bible just says those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony. That's the only requirement. Do you understand? To accept Jesus in your heart, to keep his word and his test, that's the only requirement. God hasn't made it hard for us. He's like, this is the basics. I'll do the rest. <laughs> just show up. If you show up, I will show out in you. And this is why in Malachi, he says, that Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord God of armies, will come to your temple to fight against the demons in your tabernacle. And he's going to wage war against demonic spirits because he's got to burn them out of you in order for you to be refined as pure gold. Now, gold is a great conductor of electricity. But in the tabernacle, the most holy was plated with gold everywhere. And that's where God was. As you got closer to the most holy place, it went up in value. And this is what he's saying. I'm going to refine you till you go up in value. So that I can reside in you. You want to go up in value, give Jesus a shot today. If you want to change your view and the way that you live and you're not happy with the way that the devil's been tossing you around. I want you to give Jesus a shot. In Luke chapter 9 and chapter 10, the Bible says that Jesus gave them the power over scorpions, demons, and all forces to trample on the foot. And they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us. He said, yeah, yeah, don't worry about that. Just make sure your name's in the book of life. 
See, the power was given to the church without reproach. You already have that power. What Jesus is saying is, make sure you're in the good book. Because the power comes without reproach. We have two people. Is there anybody else that wants to give God a chance again in their life? All right, let's pray. For the young lady back there who raised her hand, I ask that someone just put a hand around her. Just hug her. Thank you so much. So she feels the love. Appreciate that. Father, we give you thanks for these two ladies who have given their hearts to Jesus today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for being rooted and grounded in Ephesians 3.17. So that you could cleanse us, Father. So that you could do the thing that only you can by walking blamelessly before you to prepare us for eternal work. We thank you so much that you've come into our tabernacles to make us holy and acceptable before you. I thank you for your love and I thank you for your faithful dedication in striving with us to save our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. That boy good. <laughs> Sexy chocolate. <laughs> no. But on a serious note, <laughs> but on a serious note, Neil, I, um, I want to thank you for that very powerful message. There's one thing that I observe about um, Neil's messages. He always reminds us of our royal position in Christ. You know, he always reminds us of that and I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for that powerful message. Could it be, you know, that was very thought provoking. Could it be that our lives are being canonized for future worlds and angels? That your life is in a Bible for the future? I don't know. I don't know, Neil, you got us thinking. Got us thinking, glory to God. All right, your boy needs your help. I need your help big time, okay? We're down to the last week. Next week, we are having our health fair. And um, this is an event that um, Dr. Jasmine organized. God put it on her heart to organize this health fair. She's got several different sponsors. You've got One Blood, the um, Palm Beach County Health Department, among a series of other health professionals or health organizations that are going to be involved with this health fair and we're going to be providing free services to the public there's going to be immunizations there's going to be physicals screenings blood pressure checks cholesterol checks a lot of people have difficulty or can't even afford health care and a lot of these uh, screenings and checks are going to help them to discover issues that they might have in their lives and we have doctors that are going to be volunteering to treat patients pro bono so this is big you know this is big it's a big service that we're offering to the community in addition to all the services being provided we're going to be offering distributing 200 backpacks filled with school supplies to students for the upcoming school years kids that may need um, school supplies so this is big and we want to get the word out but your boy needs your help I really really need your help we're down to the last week we want to make sure that people are aware so we are distributing these flyers and I'm gonna ask for 20 people to volunteer to take a little stack like this. I have a, a sheet of paper wrapped around it. Inside that sheet of paper, there is an address to a grocery store nearby. I have 20 grocery stores. And I made the pack, the packs deliberately small because I don't wanna scare you and make you think like you're gonna be out there all day. But if you would take one pack this big, and go to the address that is here, which is a grocery store, and just distribute these to a few people that you see coming in and out of the grocery stores. Some grocery stores may not permit it. They may chase you out of there and call the cops on you. Just kidding. <laughs> if that happens, run. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> if that happens, just comply and just leave the premises, right? But I'm asking for a favor today. Okay, I don't normally reach out and ask for you to help me like this, but I'm asking for a favor that you pick up a little stack. Look at this. A little stack like this, right? That has a sheet of paper wrapped around it and an address in it. You just go to that address, you spend maybe a half an hour, 45 minutes, get rid of this little pack, 
and that's one way we're getting the word out. I do have a postcard campaign. Homes nearby have been receiving postcards in the mail with this. We have, you know, email marketing going out. You know, we have, um, you know, social media marketing going out. We have those billboards up front. We've been trying to get the word out through a number of means, but we really need your help. You've probably been getting my emails, uh, just really asking for help to get the word out. We really want to pack this place. We have a whole system set up to really serve this community, and we just want to help. We just want to be able to serve the community, provide these services, give out these backpacks. The other way that you can help if you're not going to be distributing flyers for me today is you can participate at the health fair. We have a lot of work that would need to be done, booths that need to be manned, registration, backpack distribution, all sorts of stuff. We're going to be having a meeting here on Tuesday at 7 p.m. to go over details and distribute responsibilities. But next week is going to be a big week. We're actually dedicating our entire service to serving our community. So we'll be here at 10 o'clock. We'll be here from 10 a.m. until 5 p.m. And we expect the public to start coming in at noon. So we hope you'll participate. Could I see, a, by a show of hands, who would want to help us today with distributing a small pack to a grocery store? I got one. I need 20. So I got one, two, three, four. All right. So all of you who want to help me, just meet me at the front desk. And I'll give you a little pack. Can't hold a pack. It's so heavy. But the little pack of flyers, and if we can get rid of these today, that'll be great. And then we'll be distributing the rest to the, na the neighborhood throughout the week, uh, hoping to really get this place packed for next week. We hope you guys have a fantastic rest of your Sabbath. We are having lunch, so we invite you to stay back and enjoy lunch. Thank you again, Neil. We really, really appreciate that powerful message. It's always a pleasure having you with us. You know, are you back here? Are you local? You're local or are you in New York or what? You're back and forth from New York to Florida. Well, when you're in Florida, we hope to see more of you here. Okay? So thank you again. All right, guys, you enjoy the rest of your Sabbath. I love you as always.